To introduce the Mississippian period, I'd like to talk about our next to last issue, the Southeastern Ceremonial Complex. It's controversial whether or not I should use this phrase, Southeastern Ceremonial Complex. However, it is prevalent in the historic literature of Southeastern archeology. span The Southeastern Ceremonial Complex refers to a unity of iconographic themes and motifs across a widespread geographic area. It may be linked to religion, or it may be a little bit more political and appropriation of beliefs and symbols to bolster elite authority. Or perhaps, as Bro said, it was a ritual expression of the idealized social patterning of societies in an effort to retain traditional cultural values in the face of changing conditions. What do anthropologists consider to be ideological or religious systems? It's a means by which a society codifies beliefs about the natural and supernatural worlds. So it relates supernatural phenomena to the everyday world. Now, how can archeologists study past ideas like ideological systems? Obviously myths or supernatural phenomena or even beliefs are not likely to be preserved directly. However, we can observe rituals and symbols associated with ideology. What is a ritual to an anthropologist? It's a stereotyped repetitive behavioral sequence, and it's generally accompanied by oral or written literature, a set of sacred objects, perhaps a sequence of taboos, feasts and or sacrifices and symbols. We distinguish two classes of rituals calendrical and critical rituals. As implied by their name, calendrical rituals are based on calendrical events. They're scheduled long in advance of the event's occurrence, and they are always for the community. Two examples of calendrical rituals include the green corn ceremony, or the first harvest ceremony, as pictured here, or the ceremony to begin planting crops. In order to maintain calendrical rituals, the society needs to keep some kind of calendar. And this could either be by building structures or by using natural horizon markers. For example, at Cahokia, Illinois, outside of present day St. Louis, a wood hinge was built, shown here at the end of the arrow. However, you can also use the natural horizon if it's appropriate to supply calendrical markers. The Hopi use the natural horizon of the mesas around them. You could anticipate activities by the daily shift of the sunrise on the horizon. Perhaps the sun rises here in the winter time and here in the summertime. A critical ritual is non-calendrical and it may benefit an individual, a group, or the entire society. Two examples of this would be a wedding and a funeral. I'll illustrate by talking about a funeral ritual today. Funeral rituals are scheduled at more than one place and in a certain order. The first ceremony may be at a special facility, either secular, like a mortuary chapel, or religious, like a church. The body may be in a special box on display at the front of the room, or the box may be closed. The family chooses how to dress the body and may include offerings or insignia in the box with the body. People also send offerings ahead of time and these are displayed near the body. Can greet visitors at this first ritual and the visitors may place their names in a special book. Many guests form a procession to the place of burial where the second ritual takes place. The body in its box is placed under a specially erected tent and the family is seated on chairs under the tent. All of the offerings from the first ritual are brought here and some may be placed on top of the box. After a brief ceremony, the box is lowered into the ground. The family may ceremonially shuffle some dirt on top. And later, a special, usually stone or sometimes metal, memorial marker is placed at the head of the hole. The first two rituals may both take place at the graveside and a third ritual may occur at a home or at a facility. At the third ritual, family members feed guests. 
and special temporary memorials to the deceased may be displayed. What can we say about the funeral of a chief in a southeastern Mississippian chiefdom? In life, during state affairs, the chief was carried on a wooden litter, as seen here in Louisiana in the early 1700s and sketched by pencil. At his funeral, his body was displayed on that same litter. Here you see a funeral procession taking the body on its litter to the mortuary chapel. And then the body was buried on the litter. This is an example of a litter that was preserved in Cahokia, Illinois. In every case where the wood of the litter has been identified, and in most cases it was not, but when it was, it has always been eastern red cedar wood, a wood set aside for special purposes. It appears that many of the Mississippian mounds got their start at the funeral of a chief, and mounds grew taller and bigger as new layers were added through time. A chief was buried with symbolic regalia, often made of exotic, that is, not local, materials. How can we identify a ritual as an archaeologist? Well, we look for the symbols, sacred objects, feasts, and repetitive behavior. When we look at the symbols or iconography, we look for a number of factors. Are these local symbols versus superlocal symbols? Are these symbols exhibited on local versus exotic, not local, raw materials? And of course, a large question is, even though we may be able to see symbols, can we interpret them only from our own point of view? And archeologists in the past several decades have worked very hard to try to interpret them as they may have been interpreted in the past. In the Southeastern Ceremonial Complex, we can identify probable workshops, places where certain styles of iconography originated or were made. Archaeologists consider mortuary practices to be imbued with rituals. You may find symbols. Is the person buried at all? How are they buried? Where are they buried? With what are they buried? So for example, you may find red cedar litters, but not with just anybody, only with the elite. You might find, find mounds over burials, again, not with just anybody. And of course, the use of superlocal symbols would be limited to elite. Public architecture may also tell us a lot. Public architecture can refer to a building or to space. And of course, it is often the location of rituals. For example, I've already spoken before about the wood hinge at Cahokia, a place where a calendar was built and rebuilt several times. And we've talked before about conical burial mounds like you see on the left here. And Mississippian flat top platform mounds are known for having permanent structures on top of them that were visible to the entire population, but their access was limited to, to a few. But also the plazas, the open areas, including the tall uh, wooden posts that may have been placed there, these are places where rituals can occur. What sorts of archeological signatures give evidence for feasting? We might find rare, labor-intensive or special foods. Then on the other hand, the quantity of food items might indicate that you needed to collect a bunch of food for a bunch of people all at once. And so it might be something very common like deer meat. And you might find deliberate waste of food items. The vessels that were used for preparation and serving might be unusual shapes, sizes, or decorations, or there might be uh, an unusual number of them. The feasting facilities may indicate feasting, so there might be special structures, special displays, and ritual disposal of materials. For example, frequently all of the vessels used for the feast were then disposed of at the conclusion of the feast. 
And food preparation facilities might be unusual in size, number, or location. The earliest writing systems appear to be for counting, including track of calendars and taxes, but later they are often used to tell myths and legends. However, it's good to keep in mind that not all symbols used are writing. Let's talk now about Mississippian religion. We can see three themes in the iconography of the Mississippian peoples. The world renewal fertility theme, which I'll talk about first, ancestor worship, and warfare cosmography. The world renewal fertility theme is the oldest theme. It probably dates back to the beginning of mound building or at least 7,000 years. This is a theme that all the people, even the commoners could celebrate. It's associated with resurfacing and building mounds, the symbolic burial of the mound, which represents the earth, a very strong symbolism. So the mound is a consecrated ceremonial area that is symbolic of the world, which both of which are renewed by the sweeping or addition of earth. I believe that the appropriation of this ancient religion by the Mississippian elite was a very savvy political move. Instead of telling the commoners, throw out your religion, it's nonsense, they took it and turned it into a way to help enable their own elite power. It includes destruction, construction, purification, the symbolic use of colors of dirt. The flat top of the mound likely symbolizes the flat four world corners of the Southeastern Indians. Associated with this is the concept of fertility or the theme of fertility. This is associated uh, with, this, with iconography showing serpents, non-raptor birds, women, cats, panther, woodpecker, and women in the moon. On the left here, you see the famous burger figurine recovered in the, area, in the American bottom area outside of present day St. Louis. This figure was deliberately broken before it was buried. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. This shows a woman with the tump line around her shoulders holding a pack on her back. In her right hand, she holds a short handled hoe and she is hoeing a panther headed serpent like you see down below. The pack on her back has a squash vine. Um, her lips are drawn back from her teeth. We think that she represents not an actual person or portrait, but a kind of an earth mother or goddess. The woman on the right, we think, might be grinding corn. The symbolism or what that object is in front of her is a little unclear. The theme of fertility also comes out in this particular supernatural old woman who never dies. And in some of the artifacts, you can see the fertility and birth cycle from birth, rebirth to adolescence, to childbearing, to old age. First woman or old woman who never dies gives birth to agricultural produce, wove the universe into being, is considered the mother of all people and helps souls return to this world. So archeological interpretation of iconography relies heavily also on the historic remnants of the myths and legends that remain. Archeologists have proposed that maize, which at least in the American bottom area had been around since the middle woodland, rose to prominence in the diet in the terminal late woodland when the elite adopted it as an important fertility symbol. Up until then, it had merely been an addition to the diet and not necessarily a very important addition. A second theme is ancestor worship associated with the elite priesthood. Priests are known to have maintained charnel houses on tops of the mounds. On the right, you see an etching from one of the, I believe it was a John White watercoloring, showing priests maintaining mummified elite bodies. Uh, main, they've uh, uh, skinned them, stuffed them, uh, well, and dried them, 
and then they maintain a fire to help the smoke help keep them from um, being infested with bugs. So there they took care of the chiefly elite bodies. We believe that figurines such as these are re related to the theme of ancestor worship. These are in highly stylized poses, um, and I believe that male poses, as you see on the right, are different from female poses, like you see on the left. And these come in all different media. For example, the top center one is made of wood, and guess what kind of wood that is? Yes, it's eastern red cedar. So they're made of any kind of media, both male and female, with highly conventional poses. This particular figure of stone, painted, is from Etowa in northwestern Georgia. Figures like this were often ritually killed before they were deposited. Again, the lips pulled back from the teeth indicate that this is not a portrait of a person, but instead um, a symbol of an ancestor. We find also wooden statues, totems, costumes, hair ornaments, headdresses, cups, beads, symbolic weapons, along with these ancestor figurines. And as I said, sometimes they were ritually killed and buried, and not infrequently buried with eastern red cedar or tobacco. The third theme is warfare cosmography. What is cos cosmography? what refers to the mythical stories that accompany a society. On the left, an actual stone mace and the yellow arrow points to uh, an, a depiction of a person holding a severed head in one hand and a stone mace like the one that you see here in the other. This iconography appears to be limited to the elite Items are very well made, and they're really not very utilitarian, but they have a lot of display value. And the art is otherworldly or mythic, showing a layered cosmos. In other words, long, complex stories that take at least an hour to tell, that take place in many different parts of the world, the upper world, this world, the lower world. They probably represent charter myths used to reinforce the ritual and status of the elite. Supernaturals include Morningstar as Birdman, here part bird, part man. Morningstar, also he who wears human heads on his ears, known in historic literature as Redhorn, rescued day from night. He brought the sun out of the underworld and he represents the triumph of life over death. These depictions are frequently made using exotic raw materials. They typically show figures on red pose copper, as you see on the right, marine shell gorgets, as you see up above, and on shell cups. The individual elements of the motifs have been interpreted. The forked eye or weeping eye, as you see here. Symbolic weapons such as maces, like this person is holding in their left hand. The underwater panther is another example of a supernatural, the lord of death and underwater beneath the world, found beneath whirlpools and eddies, sometimes called the cave panther, the snake, the winged serpent. Here the artist has incorporated a number of the symbols that we see in the archeological iconography. I wanna point out in particular, the cross in the circle. You see it at the top of the tree, you see it on top of the middle world, you see it in the beneath world. And a symbol, the way that this symbol is portrayed can tell you where you are in the story. So if it's just a plain cross in a circle, you're in the middle world. But if it's curved a little bit, you're in the beneath world. And if it has this petaloid structure around it, you're in the above world. And so iconog iconographic symbols like this that are locators can help tell you what part of a great long myth 
that you are seeing in that set scene on that particular artifact. Also, I'd like to point out the axis mundi. What looks like a pole down at the base extending from the beneath the world into the middle world, up into the above world, also called an axis mundi, portrayed as a tree at the top. And I believe the artist was trying to show an eastern red cedar tree, or if he wasn't, he should have been. We can now identify a number of local and regional traditions within the southeastern ceremonial complex. We see variety through time and also across space. We see connections from the southeastern early woodland, from the Hopewell middle woodland, and so all of these developments were in C2 developments that occurred here in the southeastern United States. The peak of exchange of raw materials and finished goods was early, or at about AD 1250. What is Mississippian then? Mississippian is ranked societies in the southeast, organized in chiefdoms, who shared a common ideological base with the three themes of world renewal fertility, ancestor worship, and warfare cosmography.